your host, Sierra Cornell, and welcome to Songwriters Unblocked. With new episodes released weekly, the show is an in-depth exploration of the songwriting process. I interview writers from all genres and backgrounds, and we have conversations on the ins and outs of inspiration, effective storytelling, overcoming writer's block, and more. From the nuts and bolts of songwriting theory to the emotional side of putting your hopes and fears out into the world, I go deep with each one of my guests to uncover what it means to be a songwriter. Thanks for tuning in and enjoy the episode. If you mixed Elton John's melodies with Brandy Newman's wit-filled lyrics and Chris Martin's silky vocals and put them on a baseball diamond, you'd get Kieran Rhodes. Hailing from Burnt Hills, New York, Kieran was on track to play serious college baseball when he discovered a love for music in high school. He taught himself piano and began writing songs in his late teenage years. To date, the prolific, curious, empathetic, and playful alt-singer-songwriter has released eight singles and an EP on the corner of Somewhere Street. Most recently known for his viral audition on season 17 of America's Got Talent, Rhodes won the heart of millions around the world with his original Disengage, which chronicles a struggle with depression. Hi, Kieran. Welcome to Songwriters Unblocked. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you here. Um, So the first question that I start out by asking everybody is, tell us a little bit about the first song that you ever wrote. And now this can be the first song that you ever wrote in your entire life. It can also be maybe the first real song that you wrote. Just give us a sense. Yeah. Um, All right. Well, the first song that I ever wrote was actually, I think it was between junior year and senior year of high school which was not that long ago it was probably i think that was like 2019 um so i haven't been writing for that long um but i remember i wrote this really weird song on guitar called men on mars and i don't even know what i was thinking when i wrote it i i don't even remember if i was sitting down to write a song it just kind of ended up happening and then i was like oh i'm gonna think i'm gonna release it and i released it and at that point nobody really knew me for music at all in my area so like when i released it um it had a very very great response and it was a response that i you know totally had no idea that i was going to get um but you know people people from all over the area like were listening to it and loved it and i was like oh well i guess i'll just you know keep writing songs mm-hmm. um <laughs> after that but then I just kept writing after that and it just went over and over and over again that's awesome so were you doing music at all before the song and before people started responding to it positively was it a bit maybe more of a hobby or was it kind of something that you were focusing on yeah so actually music music didn't mean much to me um for most of my life I was a baseball player almost went to college for baseball. Like since I was a little kid, it was just always baseball, baseball, baseball. Um, The goal, the goal was to play professionally and I was taking it very seriously. I mean, I was away year round from like (laughs) late elementary school to all the way through the beginning of high school. Um, I was just away at tournaments, you know, playing because the whole thing is that when you're serious about baseball, um, as like a middle schooler, your whole goal is to get on to a really good travel team. And when mm-hmm. you're on a good travel team, you travel and you play a lot of tournaments around, around the country, around the area. And at these tournaments, there are college scouts there. And those cal- college scouts are there to scout you and see if they want to pull you onto their college team. So that's that, that was my whole life for, for many, many years. And music was just a class that I took. I was in band. I played percussion. Um, I didn't like it. My mom made me do it. Um, It didn't mean much to me at all. I could have quit at any second and I would have been fine with it. Um, But yeah, high school, freshman year, I had this very sudden, crazy, weird urge to sit down at the piano and I sat down at the piano that I had walked by every single day of my life in my house. Um, and I just started watching YouTube videos and I learned who Billy Joel was and I wanted to be like him all of a sudden. And I would just kind of watch things and mimic what he was doing and try and figure out how the piano worked, you know, all by myself. And it was very, very weird because like I said, music didn't mean much to me at all before that. So it was this very sudden 
change of direction. Um, but after that, it just kind of got more serious. I would just learn more and more and watch more videos. And I think around sophomore to junior year, I opened my mouth to sing. I had never done that before. I didn't know that I could sing. I had no idea that I even had a voice, um, but I tried and somehow it worked and um, hopefully it continues to work. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I uh, started singing with, with my playing and like I said, I mean, the, the songwriting came very, very late. The songwriting was like junior year, senior year. Uh, but I was really just trying to figure out how the piano worked and how music worked because I was super late to all to all of it. I had never learned how to read sheet music. Um, I mean, even going to Berkeley now, um, I struggle a lot with reading sheet music because I'm self-taught. So I, I learned a lot of things by ear and by feeling. And I think that's what what projected me into songwriting a lot was because I learned not by notes on a page, I learned by feeling. And I had this overwhelming sense of feeling that really helped me step into the songwriting world. Yeah. Wow. That's really interesting. Um, such an unusual process, I feel. Um, yeah, it was, it was really, it was really awkward too. like in high school. Cause I was still playing baseball. So I was still on varsity baseball in high school. Um, but I was slowly getting into music more. So I would be like leaving my baseball practices for like a band rehearsal or something. And my like team would laugh at me or like poke fun at me because I was leaving baseball to go like do music. But it was like this very awkward transition period. Um, but I was still doing baseball. I never stopped. I, I couldn't, it would have been so weird if I just all of a sudden left the team. Like I had been playing with these kids since I was little and I was, I was a, I was a big part of the team and, you know, they needed me and we needed each other and I wasn't going to leave. Yeah. That's really interesting. It must've been perhaps a bit of an identity crisis as you started to discover something new. And what mm -hmm. was it like to decide to go to music school? Cause I mean, that's a very big difference, you know, being scouted for baseball to a school like Berkeley. What, what was that process like? Yeah, so I only applied, which is many people will think this is very stupid, uh, but I only applied to one school. Um, part of it was because I'm lazy. Uh, the <laughs> other part of it, most the most part of it is just that I had a lot of confidence in what I was doing and what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, I knew that I was supposed to be a songwriter. I was supposed to be an artist. I was supposed to, you know, be this be this person. I, I knew it. And I knew that Berkeley was the only place that I could go to do that. Um, so I looked into all these other music schools and all these other music schools, you needed to be like classically trained and you, like the auditions were like classical pieces and you had to sight read and you had to read music. And like, I was like, I, I mean, I just started playing three years ago. I don't really know. I only know how to read chords. I don't really I mean, if you put music in front of me, I would do terrible. So like all, every other music school was pretty much off the table because it, it had to be. I mean, Berkeley was the only place that was contemporary enough to accept people from all areas of music, every, you know, everybody. Um, but I only applied to one school. Um, it was Berkeley. I didn't even think like I wasn't going to get accepted. I was just like, it's going to happen. It's meant to happen. There's no way it doesn't happen. Um, I'm going to walk in and do my thing. And I think I, I played a Billy Joel song, obviously, cause of course I did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I played, I played and sang scenes from an Italian restaurant by Billy Joel. And then I played like some original song that I wrote in high school that is hard for me to listen to today. <laughs> um, but it got me in, I mean, they put, they put sheet music in front of me to sight read and I just like didn't do it. I was like, Hey, I can't do this. Sorry. And I was like, but I can write a, I can write a freaking song and I'm going to play <laughs> it for you. And so I kind of just had to be confident in what I could do. Um, it was less of what I couldn't, it was more of, I know what I can do and I'm here to show you that, you know? Yeah. That's awesome. And what I'm hearing a lot of is like the certainty, which is so cool. Um, when you're, you know, in the mm. the stages of developing a song and writing a song how do you tap into that 
sense of, of certainty, whether, you know, okay, the song isn't finished. Oh, the song is done now. Oh, this is a good song. Um, seems like you have a very good sense of judgment about yourself and your own abilities. Does that also play a role in the songwriting process for you? Yeah, I would say that, I would say that it, it is a different entity. I'd say that when, when it comes to writing a song, I am very much in the headspace of the song and whatever I'm trying to say in that. I think I know that when I'm writing a song, it's, it's something that's supposed to be happening. Um, but I think overall, my, just, my mentality towards being a songwriter is that way. Um, but I don't think it really it steps into like individually one of my works because mm-hmm. I think when I'm writing a song, I'm very much in that mindset and that world and that character and whatever it is, and I don't really think about anything else. It's kind of just bringing that thing that I'm very clear about talking about, you know, to life. Yeah. If that answers your question, I don't know if that yeah. answers your question. No, for sure, absolutely. Do you want to walk us through your songwriting process? Yeah, um, it's very sloppy. I mean, I don't, I'll tell you this, I don't write things down, which is bad. Um, I put everything in my head. It also helps me to remember lyrics that way. I think it, it's a little messy and I do need to change it. I need to start writing lyrics down on paper so I remember things. But what I'll do is I'll just play things over and over and over again and I'll remember lyrics. So I will, I will write them down in my head. So I, it, it kind of makes things very busy in my mind, um, all of the time because I, I rarely put a pen to paper when I'm writing songs. Um, but I think that just goes back to the whole root of how I learned from, from feeling, um, that's that I didn't know. I didn't know chords as their names. You know, I just knew like at Berkeley, like they call going to the six minor chord, a deceptive resolution, and I didn't know that it was called that or I didn't know it as that. I just knew that Randy Newman did it a lot. And I knew that when he did it, it made my it made my arms get chills and I wanted to replicate that. So I would I would sit down and I would try and figure out where he just went that made me get the chills and I would kind of find it and then I'd put it on my tool belt and I would just build all of these feelings all around my tool belt. So when I was writing and I wanted an audience to feel a certain way that made me feel that way, I would just go to my tool belt and try and replicate what I heard and what I tried to figure out. So when I'm writing, it's very much, it's very much feeling based. I think I'll start with, I usually start with the piano because that's, that's kind of where I'm, where I'm comfortable. So I'll, I'll sit at the piano and I will write usually like a chord progression with a melody. And I can't tell you specifically how it happens every time because it's very different sometimes. Um, and I know it's it's weird, but I mean, sometimes you just sit down and it all comes out and it's hard to pin down when those times work. And because you can't, you can't ever predict those times. And I find that when you're searching for, when you're searching for the perfect song, you'll never find it. Um, so it's kind of your job to to throw that away and live and exist. And when the time comes that you do sit down and write something great, it's going to be great. But if you sit down and say, I need to write something great, I need to write down, I need to sit down and write my best song. You'll just never do it. You'll never do it. So yeah. you kind of have to like step away, you know? That's so true. I was in a session yesterday and we were writing the hook and somebody in the room was like, this needs to be like a statement. Like this has to be that quotable line. And we spent like 30 minutes, you know, just getting absolutely nowhere. Cause we were all like, mm-hmm. Oh, well, is this quotable? Is that quotable? Is this good enough? Is that good enough? Yeah. And it, you know, and then I, I got to a point where I was like, guys, we're never going to write this thinking that we have to write this. You know, you get yeah. those lines and those moments and those entire songs, you know, not by forcing them. It just, yeah, I mean that that's how, so like I, I didn't, I didn't finish answering your question before I sit down at the piano. I, I, I write melodies on the piano. So I'll write kind of like the piano accompaniment first. Mm-hmm. Right. And then, and then I'll just start singing that melody, humming that melody, mouthing that melody. It's really weird, but I'll just start singing syllables. 
um, and things that feel right, syllables that feel right in the context of the mood and the genre. And those syllables will turn into words and somehow I'll string some line of word together and it'll be clear and I'll be like, oh, I think I also want to say this. And then hopefully by that time, I have more of an idea of what I want to talk about. That's one way. Other Mm -hmm. ways is I'll write a melody on the piano. The piano accompaniment's kind of there. And I'll just kind of think of a line, right? Like I'll think of like somebody will say something like, oh, like disengaged, right? So I'll hear that word and I'll be like, oh, that could be really cool if I put it in a song, right? So then I would try that word in in this list of 10 piano accompaniments that I have and see if I can make it work anywhere. Uh, but it's very much about the story that the music is trying to tell. I think I get really stuck on saying the right thing because the music itself is telling you something, the chord progression, the melody, it's telling you something. And your job is to fit that with the right words. And I I think personally, that's what makes a successful song is that when your topic and your concept and your story matches, you know, the musical story that the music is trying to tell. Because if you write a really sad song and you talk about something super happy, that could work. But, you know, it kind of depends on what the mood is, you know, what, what it's trying to set, the scene it's trying to set. Absolutely. I think that's a super important part. And it's all about, you know, creating a cohesive experience for the people listening and having that story and those words match the musical aspect of it is, is very, very important. And there's so much that you can do to have those things connect. So yeah. it's great that you, you know, are so conscious and aware of that. And it sounds like, um, you know, you keep coming back to this learning by feeling, and oh, does this feel right? Um, which is certainly how I've noticed that a lot of songwriters conceptualize and talk about these things is like, oh, there's just this inner sense of knowing and feeling um, that drives the songwriting process. Um mm-hmm. Yeah. When you're writing a song, are you able to are you able to write things without this feeling? For example, you know, if you were to be in a co-writing session with somebody else and they were talking about their life and it wasn't something that you related to, is it something where you're able to, you know, write outside of this world or does it always play a part in your process? I'd say for the most part, it always, it's always there. And I think that it, it tells me if a song works or not. And if I don't Mm -hmm. think something works, then I'll just throw it away. Um, Honestly, I haven't really co-written a lot. A lot of my music, I sit down and write myself. Um, It's kind of just a personal preference thing. I mean, I would love to work with people um, and co-write with other people, but I think having that personal relationship is is probably a necessity for me because it's it's so important to be able to really understand what you're trying to talk about. And I think when you know somebody well, it's very easy to kind of strip things down, understand them, and have it make sense. Um, but I, I haven't been in a lot of the co-writing experiences yet, at least. Um, but a lot of my writing... <sighs> I tend to step out of myself. I think my song Disengage was like one of the only songs that's like easily the most vulnerable thing I've ever written. And that song was very much, yes, this is about me. This is about me. This is about me. This is about me. All of my other songs seem to be about a character or somebody else. I think writing Disengage was very much much intentionally through myself. Um, But a lot of my other music is telling someone else's story, telling some other story um, that can also be related to. But I mean, I, I think when I'm talking about something else, some other story, someone else's experience, obviously a little bit of you creeps through into that. And I think that's what makes songwriting special. And that's what gives people their own voices. And that's why, you know, there are millions of love songs out there pretty much about the same exact thing. Um, but they're all different is because everybody's different and they put their own voice into all, all of these things, you know? Absolutely. I, I totally agree. And where do these stories come from? 
Where do these characters come from? Um, that's a good question. I, I couldn't even, I couldn't tell you. I really couldn't. I think, I think the songs in general, if I were to tell you where the songs come from, it's very much above me. I think somehow, somehow I'll be writing something and like a lyric line will pop into my head and I'll write it down. I have no idea where it came from, um, but it falls into my lap. Um, and that ties into the whole, this is what I'm supposed to do for the rest of my life because, you know, my life took a crazy turn from baseball and all of a sudden I'm just so sure of this whole music thing and I'm writing songs that people actually like and I've never had really done that before and all of a sudden I'm writing things that mean something to other people and it's like, what, I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm kind of just listening to what's going on in my head and I'm writing it down and just like, what is this? I'm kind of just the messenger. That's what I'm trying to say is that I am just the messenger. Um, but when it comes to like writing stories and talking about other things, um, those things will just pop into my head. I mean, sometimes I'll do exercises where I'll watch like a movie or read something or hear about something. And I'll be like, okay, I'm going to try and write a song about this. or I'm going to try and write a song about, uh, this experience or this person or this person going through this. Um, and those are fun and those are good exercises, but those tend to be songs that I end up scrapping because, you know, that initial like magic wasn't there. I kind of for, it was a little forced, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. There are some very big songwriters who also kind of say this, the same thing, this feeling of just being the messenger, Th these ideas coming from someplace greater and outside of you and feeling very much like you're just the vessel to, to tell these stories. So I think that's that's really cool. And I had a guest on the on the show previously who also, you know, talked about this feeling and and having this really be a, a guide for her as to, you know, whether the song is working or not. Um, so it's really it, it's cool to see how certain songwriters will have a very strong um relationship with this feeling and and the sense of of being a, a messenger or a vessel. Um, so I think that's really, it's so interesting to see how everyone kind of describes it. Cause I think we all have it to different degrees. There are always going to be words or phrases or maybe songs that just kind of came from nowhere. And you're like, I, I don't know really how this happened, but it did. <laughs> um, yeah. and yeah, continue. yeah, go ahead. But I guess there isn't, it's, it's a lot of that, but it's, there also is a level of like, yeah, does this song, does this song mathematically work? Mm -hmm. Like, is this melody catchy? Like, there is an aspect to that. I mean, in my mind, it's very important, but I don't think of that nearly as much as the story that I'm trying to tell because, you know, but I, I do this thing. Well, I've, I've come to do this thing called like the hum test and I, it started at my house, at the piano, I would be writing songs and my mom would be in the kitchen and I would just be like cranking through this idea, playing this thing over and over and over again because I'm trying to write to it and I love the melody and I'm just trying to figure out what it's trying to say. And I'll just play it over and over and over again and my mom will be in the kitchen making dinner. And then like we'll be having dinner um, like a couple hours later and she'll like start humming it. Right. And I'll be like, wait, could what did you just do? Could you do that again? And she like hummed it back to me. I was like, great. That's a good <laughs> song. I was like, that's going to work. Uh, and she'll get up the next morning and she'll be like here. And your song was in my in my head the whole night. And I'm like, okay, great. That's 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 good. Um, that's what I'm kind of looking for. Um, I'm glad that I'm glad that 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 happened. I mean, I don't rely on that every single time because obviously I don't have people listening to my songs always. Um, but it even happens with my best friend. Like I'll, I'll play a song for my best friend from home and I'll keep a close eye on him over the next couple of days when I'm with him to see if he starts humming it. And sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. And when he does, I'm like, did you just hum? And he's like, oh, I did. And I'm like, great, great. So I'm going to work on that song next. Um, you know, <laughs> That's such a great word, like the hum test. That's uh, that's fantastic. <laughs> I have noticed that if I have multiple melody ideas, um, I 
I like to try out a, a whole bunch of ideas as I'm writing just to make sure that I'm not getting stuck on the first thing that comes mm-hmm. to my head. Um, and I always find that the one that I remember is is usually the best one. So Yeah, I like um, to think of, I heard um, Paul McCartney talking about um, his writing with the Beatles and he was talking about how when they were writing songs, they didn't have, they didn't have like voice memos to like hum melodies or like remember things. They were on tour buses touring, right? And they had to write songs. And Paul Paul was saying, we just had to write songs that that we could remember. Like we had to write catchy things because if we didn't write catchy songs, then we wouldn't remember them. We wouldn't even be able to write them or remember that we wrote them because they wouldn't be catchy enough. And I thought that was really funny because obviously all of their songs are incredibly catchy. <laughs> That's so true. And we have so many things to lean on these days with voice memos and DAWs and software and all of these these things that can really, you know, just capture every single little thing. And and I think it's important to, rem- to, to keep in mind that the things that are memorable that you hear other people singing are are really what will will stick. Cause yeah, I mean, my voice memos are so messy. I mean, so messy. <laughs> like I, I, I mean, that's that's what I use voice memos. That's mm-hmm. my, that's my notepad. Voice memos is my notepad. Like I said, I I rarely put a pencil to paper when I'm writing a song. It just I, it doesn't feel right to me. It obviously, like I said, it it clogs up my brain a little bit. So there's less space to make decisions because I'm just kind of remembering lyrics and it's a little, it's a little messy, but I get through it. But what I do is I'll just have a verse idea. I'll sing it in my voice memos and what I'll do if I like an idea enough and I like a melody enough and I like, like a concept enough is I'll make a folder. I'll call it something and I'll just continue to make little voice memos inside of that folder, inside of that song. Um, and just kind of write the song in those voice memos <laughs> so I could remember it. Um, but, you know, I have all of these folders. I have like 15 plus folders of these songs that I feel super competent, confident in. And I'll just move on to the next one and kind of not throw it away. I ju- I'll just kind of put it on pause and move on. And that happens a lot. Yeah, yeah. I think it it's certainly really, really helpful for keeping a a log of songs. Maybe the song isn't fully ready yet, but you can have those ideas there and you can, you can capture what you're kind of thinking in the moment and then return to it. Maybe when you're in a better headspace or you kind of have a new angle into the, into the idea. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I think (laughs) I have thousands and thousands of voice memos. And honestly, I don't even go back and listen to all of them. I I'd say like maybe like 5% of the time I'm like, Oh, I had that melody idea and that one, you know, one, one spot. So, you know, that 5% of the time it it can make or break it. But yeah, when I (laughs) go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. When I go, when I go back, the only times I go back into my voice memos are when I feel like I'm not writing anything good. And then I say, Mm. Oh, well, I literally have 15 things that I felt so good about at one point. Why am I not just, why am I making myself write another good thing that I feel good about when I have 15 unfinished good things that I could be putting my attention towards? <laughs> so that's, that's so when true. I would go back. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe if you're kind of stuck with some writer's block, like you had good ideas before, don't just put so much pressure on yourself to come up with something new and amazing in the moment. Go back to your old ideas. Yeah. What I, my thing is all right. I'll write a re- I'll write a verse and a chorus and maybe another verse. So maybe maybe like two verses and a chorus, right? And I'll be like, this is this is really great. Um, my friend hummed it, whatever. Um, this is gonna be a really good song. Most of it's there. I just gotta like write a bridge or something, and then I'll just be like, okay, that's great. I'm just gonna put it here and we'll go back to it. And then the next week, instead of going back and finishing that bridge. I'll be like, oh, well, I need to I need to do something else. So then I'll make myself write another verse and another chorus that I feel like is super confident. The concept's there. It's super great. I feel like it's super great, at least. That's all that matters. <laughs> but um, <laughs> and I won't and I won't finish. I won't finish like the bridge. I'll just kind of have like this, the beef of it there. But there's things that are missing. And then I'll be like, great. This is another good idea that is mostly there that I'll just come back to. 
And then I'll just keep, I'll keep doing that. And I'll just rack up all of these little verses and choruses, these little like bits of songs, you know, these, I have like these just outlines of songs where I'm like, okay, this is the chorus. This is definitely going to be the chorus. It works really well. I don't have like, you know, 10, 15 of them. And yeah. it gets a little, it gets a little much sometimes though, because I don't, I don't think I put enough pressure on myself to go finish them. But there is something special about revisiting a song when, you're, when your perspective has changed, when your life has changed, when things have come about in different ways. It'll give you a new, um, fresh take on what you've previously written. I, I heard John Mayer talk about how, you know, he just tries to write something as fast as he can because you're never going to be in this mindset. You're never going to be in this place again. Um, and I totally agree with that. But when you can't do that, there is good in revisiting a song and being like, okay, I grew up in a little, I grew up a little bit. Maybe I don't want to say, say it like this. Mm -hmm. Maybe I want to do something different. I learned, I learned how to do, I learned how to go to this chord. Maybe I'm going to put that in there now. That was the missing piece. I just needed to wait six months and learn it. Right. That's why I didn't finish the songs because I needed to wait six months to learn the best part that I hadn't written yet. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. I find that I usually do a verse, a pre, and then a chorus. And when I get to verse two, I, I'm like, I'm done. And then it'll set for weeks, sit for months, and then eventually, or never. Oftentimes, I never come back to it. But if I do come back yeah. to it, then I'm like, okay, I have some distance. I have some perspective. I feel like I know what verse two needs to have and, and kind of, you know, reorganize it a little bit. So Yeah, and, but and all those... Yeah, all those demos that I have, though, I even though they're like three quarters of the way finished, I know that those are probably all going to make up whatever my album, my first album is mm -hmm. going to be, like I, at some point. You know, I know that I'll re revisit them when the time is right and finish them when I need to, and that'll make up my album. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. It's all part of the process, you know, even if, for me at least, if something doesn't get done ever, um, I, I, I find that those songs always are, are the ones that make way for the finished songs, for the songs that come out really easily. Like that, that process of, of struggling through something and coming back to it and revisiting it always allows for those songs that come out really fast and really easily to happen. You've mentioned Billy Joel a lot. Tell me about your influences. How have you pulled from them what parts of you know you as an artist um reflects the the people that you kind of grew up listening to or learned from as you were um discovering yourself as a songwriter yeah so i'll say when i first had to sat down at the piano freshman year of high school it was billy joel that brought me there um i remember i would sit sit in my bed at night and just watch live videos of him and I would be like, that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And I would try and mimic what he did, learn what he was doing, try and be like him. And that's that's kind of, he was kind of how I taught myself how to be a musician initially. Um, but, you know, Billy Joel turned to Ellen John, obviously. And um, then as I started writing songs, my influence changed a little bit. Um, the fray was really weird. I went through a huge, uh, the fray fan paid fa fan base thing. Like I was a huge friend, uh, fan of the fray and listened to like all of their albums, knew all of their songs. Um, I think his Isaac Slade that he's the lead singer. I think his falsetto when I was first learning mm -hmm. how to sing, I was listening to a lot of him. So I have this falsetto like him. I was also listening to a lot of Coldplay during that time, and I realized that I was trying to sing like Chris Martin. I mean, that's how I, I was teaching myself how to sing while singing Chris Martin, while singing The Fray. And therefore, I, therefore now when people hear me sing and they say, hey, oh my God, you sound like Chris Martin. I'm <laughs> like, oh, that, that's funny. That makes sense because he kind of taught me how to sing. You know, like he is the one who 
kind of told me that I have a falsetto, right? I would I would just try and do what he was doing. And I was like, oh, I can do that. That kind of, that sounds really cool. I'm going to try and apply that to what I'm doing. Uh, but it was very much picking an artist and, and grabbing something from them. Like Billy Joel, it was like the overall persona of being a musician. Chris Marin, it was very much just his stage presence, his voice, the way that he carried himself um, was just very inspiring. I, I started listening to a lot of Randy Newman and Randy Newman's harmonic decisions and his piano playing really influenced mine. So that that's kind of what I took from Randy Newman. And plus his lyricism was super witty and he always had a really clever concept. He always had a very um, interesting thing to talk about that, you know, hung the listener on. And that's kind of what I took from him too, is that when I sat down to write a song, I was like, this melody could be super catchy. The piano part could be really cool. But if the concept isn't right, nobody's going to like it. Um, mm -hmm. I think the con what I find in concepts is the songs that I feel the most confident about in my repertoire, in my voice memos, the songs that I feel most confident about in my voice memos are the songs that have the clearest and what I think is the most intelligent concept. Um, some concepts are very clear, like I'm writing a song called If I Had a Time Machine, and it's about if I had if I had a time machine, I would do this. If I had a time machine, I would do this. Um, and I think I, I personally think that concept was super clear in my head when I was writing it. I was like, this is clever. I think I think people could really relate to this. And then I'll have another song where I'll talk about like something vague, like love or something. And I'll be like, oh, this is cool. But it's like there's not that concept where somebody steps back and goes, wow, damn, that's kind of cool that he just said that. Or like, you know what I mean? Um, like R Randy Newman, like when she loved me, I mean, that song is beautiful. It's not about, it's not about like, you're, he's not saying, yes, I, I used to have this and now I don't, but he, but he says it in such a beautiful way that it's, he's almost saying something different. Um, mm -hmm. and I think being clever with concept is, is very, very important, especially now in today's world of music. It's, it's very much about concept. I think I've seen a lot in songs, especially that songs that blow up on like TikTok and stuff. I mean, I personally have had little success on TikTok. Um, but a lot of the songs that I see on TikTok that blow up just have really great concepts, like really great concepts. They're clear. They're like, damn, I wish I thought of thinking about this mm -hmm. this way, you know? And that's that's what yeah. I feel like is is what this age of music is turning into. I completely agree. I think concept is super important and I've been teaching songwriting lessons and I, for the, my students that have literally never written a song before, I always start them out with concept because I'm like, if you don't have a clear sense of what is grounding your song, what's the anchor to this idea, it's going to go nowhere. You're, you're going to have lyrics that don't really make sense. It's going to feel like you're swimming in, in an empty ocean, you know, with, with no destination. Um, yeah. so I always try to drive that home and I find that you're so true. You know, the, the songs that you really step away from and remember have that really strong sense of concept. And it's very, very prevalent now especially in like a lot of pop writing like this very um unique and interesting concept hook um yeah so i mean I, I, I completely I was, agree i was struggling a lot with writer's block as one does and i wasn't mm -hmm. writing anything good like the whole this whole summer i was like not writing anything that i really loved and i was stepping back and thinking oh i just don't have any good concepts like i need to like surround myself with more situations read more things understand things better and maybe a concept will hit me and i love marvel movies right so i love mm -hmm. star wars i love fiction i'm a huge fan of fiction because storytelling mm -hmm. is like what is who i am so like mm -hmm. i love everything storytelling and i was thinking about that this summer and i was just thinking about superheroes and superpowers and this concept came to me um about talking about how somehow I have superpowers, right? I've I've got superpowers, like what I can do, like I can write songs, I can do this. Um, and I sat down at the piano with that with that concept, and I was like, this concept is, I know this concept can work. I just got to iron it out and mm -hmm. make it make sense to to a listener. 
and I have to support it the right way. And I, I, I finished writing that this summer and I was like very happy because at the end of it, I felt as if that was one of the best songs that I had written in a while. And that's always a great mm-hmm. feeling because it makes you feel like you're not going down. Right. Yeah. It makes you feel like you're you're going up, like you're writing songs that are better than the one before it and you're just climbing. Right. So it's good to have yeah. those moments. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It's so necessary. And especially because the creative process is so up and down, like you won't write anything that you're happy with for a while. And then the minute you get that song that you're like, yes, finally, it really lifts you up. Also, like the. Uh, um, playing playing live, I feel mm. I feel the need and the want to to make people listen. I mean, I played a lot of like bars and stuff when I was in high school. And all I would do is play cover, cover songs. Like I probably have played Piano Man like 3,000 times. <laughs> um, but the one thing that I just wanted was people just to listen and be attentive. And I think that also influences my want to write clever and witty lyrics and write lyrics that make people do a double take and be like, oh, ha, ha, that's cool that he did that. Or like something like that. Because when I'm playing live, I, I love to have reactions because that tells me that people are listening and that people are buying into this story that I'm telling them. Um, so that's what I feel like that also helps in a live setting, having a good concept because you'll get a reaction. You'll get people stepping into that story with you and you're all together on it. And I think that is a very, very special thing. Absolutely. So if you could describe your songwriting in three words, what would they be? Just like my overall songwriting? Yeah. Hmm. Oh, okay. I'd say story, piano, and love. Awesome. That's that's wonderful. I love hearing the three words that people come up with because I, I find some people have them right away and other people it's... They really have to think about it, but it always seems to sum up their writing quite perfectly. And Mm -hmm. and I would say those three words are a very good description of your songs. Um, What's on the horizon for your music? Um, Well, I have a song coming out on October 28th. Um, So that is in like a week and a half. Um, Friday, October 28th, I have a song called Dead coming out. Um, super excited about it. It's, it's, it's a fun one. Can't wait to show the world. Um, as for other things, I am just at college and working (laughs) and being existing and living and being a writer and taking things in overanalyzing and eavesdropping and, you know, doing things that artists are supposed to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, that that's that's what the rest of my year is going to look like. That's awesome. And where can people listen to your music and connect with you? Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at Kieran Rhodes Music, and you can check my music out on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music under my name, Kieran Rhodes. Amazing. And anything else you want to tell our listeners before we wrap it up here? Um. Yes, I'll say that it's very easy as an artist to get sucked into what other people are doing. And I think it's very, very important that you remember who you are, remember what's in your heart and remember what makes you special and follow that. And that's where the gold is. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. It was great having you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Such wise words from Karen at the end there. So go out, be yourself, maybe try the hum test on your next song. See how memorable it is. Are your friends singing it? Are your parents singing it? And let me know what you thought about this conversation on Instagram. Follow the podcast at songwriters underscore unblocked and let's chat about this episode. Also head over to Spotify to listen to Kieran Rhodes, spelled K-I-E-R-A-N-R-H-O-D-E-S. And follow him on Instagram at Kieran Rhodes Music. And if you leave this podcast a review, take a screenshot and email it to podcast at sierracornell.com and I will send you a free downloadable songwriting journal. This is Songwriters Unblocked. Thanks for listening.